Coming up on Extra Credit, we explore the wetlands, learn about a couple of jobs that come with them, and bring some animals into our homes with some pen and paper. So stick around for more. Water is an important part of our everyday lives. We use it to clean, for transportation, and to drink. It's something we need for our bodies and for our community. But the environment needs it too. So we have to make sure we are responsible and take care of it before we give it back. But how do we do that? Water chemist Devita Quinn shows us how she gives back and takes care of our water every day through wastewater treatment. Are you curious about careers in science? Hi, I'm Genesis, and today I'm here with chemist Devita Quinn. Tell me where we are and what you do here. We're at the City of Jackson Wastewater Treatment Plant. I make sure all of the tests I ran daily on all the wastewater. All the water has to be tested to make sure that all of the organisms are dead. See how big some of them can get before we send them out to the Grand River. This is the place where when you wash your hands, when you take your bath, when you wash your clothes, all of that dirty water, it comes here, like 13.8 million gallons a day. This is all wastewater, Genesis. There's probably about 30 to 40,000 gallons of water in each of these round clarifiers. If it rains, it's even more. We can hold up to 18.8 million gallons of wastewater. It's very important to treat wastewater, correct? Yes, very important. This is all the water that we have that you see in your river, lakes, and your streams. So as the water comes into the wastewater treatment plant, we clean it up through chemical use, through biological treatment. How is STEM incorporated in your job as a chemist? I use STEM for everything. We're gonna go over to the microscope and we're gonna be working with some live bacteria. You have to be able to know what you're looking for when you're looking through the microscope. Ooh, look at that. We look through the microscope and we have all these very little bitty microbes. This is so cool. So we have to be able to tell which organisms is what because we need them. The most rewarding part of my job is protecting the environment and educating the public. So I enjoy what I do because it helps others. I got the VIP treatment today from water chemist Davida Quinn. Explore your possibilities. It's pretty awesome how Devita can do all that for her job. Do you know what you want to be when you're older? I'm not sure what I want to yet, and it's alright if you don't either. Maybe our friend Janelyn can help us out by exploring the job of an urban forest hydrologist. Are you curious about careers in science? Hi, I'm Jenilyn, and today I'm here with forest hydrologist Asia Doughton. What does a forest hydrologist do? Forest hydrologist studies how water moves through forest ecosystems. That's how it interacts with the leaves, the stems, and the bark to make its way to and through the soil. This right here is where we enter to start collecting our data. Today we're at the Hudson Woodlot of Michigan State University's campus, where we do research on forest hydrology, and the species of trees will not just impact the amount of water, but also the chemistry of the water. So my research is important because what I look at is how water interacts with trees. I look at forest hydrology in urban settings. Cities are continuing to expand. That has all types of negative impacts, like bad air quality, increased risk for flooding. So how can we use our trees to sort of manage those negative impacts or even reduce them? What does a typical day of work look like for you? It all depends on the season and whether or not it's raining. When it rains, water that makes it through the leaves will make its way into our collector. And once the rainstorms end, we can move forward with our data collection. My career is based in STEM from the root to the shoots, if you will. I use different types of scientific principles and methods to guide the research that I do. 110 milliliters of precipitation were recorded at through fall at this site. Technology plays a huge part in helping me to calculate my data. To get an accurate measurement of how much water was transported as stem flow, what we do is we calculate the depth of whatever made it into our collection bin. Engineering is used to help construct our field sites, and I have to use mathematics to work through calculating these values that we collect in the field. Are there a lot of women who work in your field? There's actually a growing number of women working in this field. My advice to young women who are interested in forest hydrology is to take a walk in nature with your eyes wide open and ask questions. 
Asia Dowson helped me branch out into the world of urban forest hydrology. Explore your possibilities. Some people call them swamps, but marshes and wetlands are in the most important ecosystems in the world. They filter fresh water we drink and provide habitats for birds, fish, and many other wildlife. Now, let's go to Metzger's Marsh in Ohio and meet some of the cool creatures who live there. A little birdie told me it's time to go wild. Compared to sandy beaches and giant sand dunes, this may not look like much, but don't be fooled. This habitat is one of the most important in the Great Lakes region. Oh, you don't believe me? Well, good thing we're taking a field trip. Before we get into why this habitat is so special, there are two important questions to ask. Number one, what is a habitat anyway? And number two, where is my guide? We'll break down question one while I go solve question two. To put it simply, a habitat is a place where an organism or a community of organisms live. Some habitat types might be easy to spot, like a beach, which is technically the zone extending from the water's edge to the limit of the highest storm waves, or dunes, which stabilize and resupply beachfronts with sand while supporting a diversity of plants and wildlife all their own. But the Great Lakes region is vast, and there are hundreds of different coastal habitat types that are less known, but just as important. One of those can be found in the Metzger Marsh Wildlife Area, just east of Toledo, Ohio. I met with Matt Kovach there. He is a coastal program manager for the Nature Conservancy. He works as part of a team restoring wetlands on the edge of Lake Erie. And that means he knows this habitat as well as anyone. Matt, thanks so much for meeting with us. So could you explain to us what are some of the defining characteristics of the Great Lakes wetlands? Sure, so Great Lakes wetlands are really, really important and special places. Mm -hmm. There really aren't many of them left. Yeah. We've lost about 95% of our wetlands in the state of Ohio. They provide really, really important wildlife habitat for fish and birds and mammals and all sorts of things. You know, there's a lot of food there. There's a lot of, pla a lot of habitat, a lot of homes for different types of animals that live out here. Uh, a lot of things that migrate, a lot of birds that migrate from south to north and north to south. Can you show us some of your favorite parts? Sure. Come out with me. I'll show you some All of these right. cool places. Let's go. So these are the coastal wetlands that are on uh, the southern shore of Lake Erie. Okay. And these are some of those habitats I told you about that are those really important coastal wetland habitats in the Great Lakes. So this is one of our really common wetland plants up here. It's called uh, either American Water Lotus or Yellow Lotus. It's got a bunch of common names. Yeah. Um, and it's just, it's, it grows really well in, you know, about three foot of water. And we wow. find it kind of fringing in a lot of those between the shallower areas of a lot of our marshes and the deeper areas that are kind of dominated by the, um, some of those submerged aquatic plants that we'd seen earlier. The wetlands can act as nature's kidneys. They can filter a lot of runoff before that water can come out here and fuel uh, algal growth. So this is a muskrat hut. This is one of the mammals that li likes to live out in these areas. And what they do is they build their homes like this, build these mounds up, and they'll have a little compartment inside of there that they'll use as their, you know, as their living room, and they'll stay in there all winter long. <laughs> their living room. It's so complex, all those different things. And so what kind of things do you think from out here or do you think are made up in this nice so, little nesting place? So there's a lot of plants that they use to construct these. Most of it is cattail. And that's okay. a plant that's growing right this here, right here? Next to you. Yep, exactly. Oh, wow. A lot of it is that. There's some smartweed growing on it too, uh, smart and they'll weed. smartweed. And there's some other plants that they'll uh, they'll use. They'll use that combined with mud that they pull up from the bottom to basically build this whole structure. And if you could, if we could see inside of it, you'll see that it's it's kind of hollowed out. There's a big open area inside of there. Right, right. And there's actually an entrance right here wow. on that side that they'll use to. Uh, to go inside so what of about it. the cattail is so unique that they use so much of it? It's so significant. They love cattail. Right. It's a food source. It's one of their favorite foods, and that's why if you look out here, all these dead, uh, these dead sticks sticking up, yeah, is basically cattail strands. If you look right over there, you can see one that's kind of been chewed up quite a bit. Um, that's probably from the family muskrats that live right in all here. All right, so they're going out for dinner. It's one, exactly. It's all one right. of their favorite foods. Thank you so much for showing us Metzger Marsh. It's beautiful out here. And I think we understand a little bit more 
why preserving habitats like this is so important. So thank you for being one of the people that helped to protect sure. it. But oh. that's the end of our field trip. I'm Morgan. Thank you so much for coming along with me. We'll see you next time, and we will be back. Okay, good. All right. There are all kinds of incredible animals that live in and under the water, like fish, otters, and fierce sharks. One of the most unique animals that lives in the water is the platypus. They live in Australia with another underwater animal, the crocodile. In this next segment, we'll learn how to draw these underwater friends. One of the most interesting and unusual animals in the whole world is the platypus. It is such a cool creature. We're gonna have so much fun drawing this one. Let's begin. We're gonna start with the eyes. We have a large oval like this. Right next to it is a letter C backwards. And then the pupils. Now a platypus is a combination of a lot of different kinds of animals. For instance, it has a beak that's very similar to a duck. So we're gonna start off with a duck's bill. Starting from, oh, about a quarter of the way up on this eye, come out, down, up, and add a dash. Down, up, and we're going to follow that line. Down, up, and around. We're going to see a little bit of the tongue just inside the mouth, like so. And then go ahead and color the rest of that in. Do it. Two lines right on top of the beak. And then eyebrows. The body of a platypus is actually a lot like an otter. So we're going to draw the body. Coming around, we got a little bit of texture to it to show that there's fur. All the way around like this and stop. Now for the front of the body, come down, around, and in. It's sort of a peanut shape. Now for the arms, letter V, out, one, two, three, and four, in, at an elbow, and up. The other arm is right here, out, one, two, three, four, and in. Now for the legs. Start off with sort of a number two shape, and then come out, and in, out, and in, out, and in. That gives us feet like a duck. And those are flippers that he uses to swim. Come in and connect, and then up slightly. The other foot is right over here. Down, there's a number two, in, out, in, out, and in. And then again, you want to connect in between. Now for the tail. The tail looks a lot like a beaver's tail. Out, up, around, down, and in. We're going to add a thin line that goes right along all the way up to the top. And then we're going to add the texture. We're going to add a grid, like a tic-tac-toe grid, or maybe a waffle. Just some vertical lines and horizontal lines. Vertical lines go up and down. Horizontal lines go across, just like that. Now we're going to add a little bit of texture to the fur. Platypus's fur is actually waterproof, which is good because they spend a lot of time in the water. Just some lines like that. Now we're gonna add a second animal from Australia into our drawing. 
We're gonna add a crocodile. We're gonna start out by giving our platypus a little bit of land to stand on here. Just a quick little bit of land like that. There we go. And now for a crocodile. Let's start with the eyes. Circle. And then a slightly smaller circle. Pupils in the eyes, just like that. Now for the eyebrows. Up, down, in. Up, down, back in. Let's add some bags under the eyes like this. Around and around. Now for that long snout. Those little bumps in the lines like that arrow shape, down, up, and a great big smile. Now let's add some teeth. Teeth are just the letter V over and over. It doesn't have to be perfectly straight. A nice crooked smile gives our crocodile a lot of personality. Now for the lower part of the mouth. Come down, out, and back in slightly. Let's add some more teeth. Sharp teeth. Now from the top of the mouth, oh, a little bit beyond the middle here, just draw a line down, and then you're gonna color in so we can sort of see inside the mouth. I'm gonna try and leave the teeth so careful not to color over them too much. There we go. Let's add the nostril. And a dash. And then another dash right there. Now we're going to come down and add the back. A couple little bumps like that, right to the very edge of the page. Come down just a little, and then we're going to add one of the arms sort of sticking out of the water. Come out, one, two, three, and back in. That little wrinkle right there. Now we're going to add some water as we make him sort of splashing, coming out of the water, hiding there. Just real quick little scribbly lines creates the illusion of water. And then we're going to add some texture onto our crocodile. Some scales. Just some quick little letter U. Very small letter U. And a couple lines on a snout like this. There you go. There is your crocodile and platypus. Be sure to sign your name and take pride in your work. Thank you for teaching us, Joe. Like Joe, one of my favorite things to do is draw. So I thought I'd try to draw the platypus and the crocodile too. Here's what I ended up with. They may not be perfect, but I had so much fun drawing them. I had to redraw a couple times to get them how I wanted. Look, I gave this one freckles like me and this one a hat. I thought I'd be cute. I didn't think my picture would turn out how it did, but that's okay. Nothing is always perfect. It's totally okay to mess up, make mistakes, and try again. And I love how mine turned out in the end. If you decide to draw these underwater creatures like I did, post them and tag us. We would love to see them. I'm sure they're awesome. Something else I love to do is to listen to music. I like all kinds, and I love to listen with my friends. Music makes me want to dance and sing as long as I can. What's your favorite song? Here's one of my favorites by Mr. C and my pal Stony D to help us learn about the water cycle. The water cycle goes round and round from the sea to the air and back to the ground. The water cycle has three different parts and with the evaporation, it always starts the water cycle. The water cycle. Evaporation is really neat. The 
rhyme that starts with the sun's heat, energy to heat, makes the water molecule bonds apart, and that's how the water cycle gets its start, and then it flows, it flows way up in the air, and then the water vapor flows way up there, but it cannot stay up there indefinitely, because as it rises, it cools, you see, the water cycle. It's going round and round From the sea to the air and back to the ground The water cycle The water cycle Now the water vapor is up in the sky Soon it will condense before our eyes Condensation forms clouds of different shapes The higher the vapor rises gives them different names Go cumulus clouds are fluffy and white While stratus clouds are like the blanket spread in the sky And cirrus clouds are wispy ones up real high Because they are made of small crystals of ice The water cycle, it's going round and round The water cycle The water cycle, it's going round and round From the sea to the air and back To the ground, the water cycle. Finally, it falls back down from the sky. If you're not very careful, it'll land in your eyes. It can come down in many different ways, and when it does, it begins to precipitate. The white, pretty crystals fall down as snow. We call it rain when it's liquid H2O. If it freezes on its way down, we call it sleep. These are three different forms, and they're all very neat. The water cycle, it's going round and round. The water cycle. The water cycle. It's going round and round from the sea to the air and back to the ground. There are so many fun things to do during the summertime. What's your favorite thing to do during summer? Some of my favorites are biking, going on picnics, and my most favorite, swimming. I love how the water feels and the sunshine on my face. I almost wish I was a fish, but maybe not. I like living on why don't we bring that underwater fun to us by drawing a picture of ourselves exploring the ocean? You might want to bring your pencils and pens, and maybe a snorkel. Let's jump in! So the first step is going to be drawing the portrait itself. So I'm just going to go ahead and sketch out the head shape, the neck, and the shoulders, and a little swimming suit here. Um, you could do this part on a separate sheet of paper and then cut it out and glue it onto another sheet of paper where you do your uh, ocean background. It's really up to you how you want to go about this, but um, I also recommend pausing this video at any point so that you can go back and really look at the details of where I'm placing the different facial features, for example, and other details. Okay, so I'm just gonna mark the center of the head shape here, both vertically and horizontally. So that horizontal center line, that's where my eyes should go. And you wanna place those eyes so that there's about an eye shape on either side of the eye as well as in the center. So just to space it out so that they're pretty even, which can be kind of tricky and it doesn't have to be perfect for this. We're gonna put some cool scuba goggles on over top of the eyes anyway, so the, focus won't really be on the eyes to begin with. So then about halfway from those eyes um, or eyebrow line to the bottom of the chin is where the nose is going to go and then for the bottom of the nose anyway and then about halfway from the nose to the chin is where that middle lip line will be. Now that I have the facial features drawn in, I can go ahead and start adding in my hair. Think about your own hair, what shape does your hair look like? Don't worry about drawing each individual strand of hair, but think of it more as a whole section of hair. We'll color it in later and you can add little strands of detail there, but for now just think of it as one large shape. All right, I'm gonna add a fun little starfish choker here to go with this theme. And now I'm gonna start adding in the background. So I'm adding in fun blues and lots of wavy lines here. 
And then from this point too, you can just be adding in whatever fish that you want. You could add fun like sea coral and seaweed, other fish, shark, jellyfish, whales, dolphins, whatever you want to add. This is your time to really be creative in that background space. You can see what I've added here. Um, and I skipped ahead just to make it a little bit faster in the video so you don't have to see the whole process, but you can see that some of the colors of the fish I let be more bluish, um, while others I let stand out to be more in the foreground. And now from here I'm just adding in detail. So here's my little strands of hair like I was talking about, but I'm mostly just blocking in the colors and keeping it really simple. So looking at different skin tones, of course, that you can use to describe your skin tone, but try to make it look like you. I think that's the a fun way to do this project where you really customize it and make it look, or personalize it, I should say, really, and make it look more um, and most like you. You can pick the colors that you want for the scuba gear um, and yeah, just have fun with this and enjoy it. Thanks for learning with me today. I'll always think of Mr. C and Stony D when I see it rain. And I had so much fun learning how to draw a platypus and a crocodile. Did you? Have an awesome day and see you next time, friends. This program is made possible in part by Michigan Department of Education, the state of Michigan, and by viewers like you.